One, two, one, two, three, four. Before we get started, we want to thank this month's sponsor. Introducing Gong.io, the number one conversation intelligence platform for sales. Gong helps you generate more revenue by having better sales conversations. It automatically captures and analyzes your team's conversations so you can transform your team into quota shattering super sellers. Visit gong.io forward slash sales hacker to get in on the action and see it live. And now on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Jacobs. We've got a great show today. I'm going to be interviewing Cassie Young, who's the Chief Commercial Officer at SaleThrough. Just a quick background about Cassie. She's one of the top marketing and sales leaders in New York City and really highly regarded across the startup ecosystem. She's been at SaleThrough for five years. She most recently moved into the CCO role, which we'll talk about. Prior to joining SaleThrough, Cassie was a longtime direct marketer who built a strong personal brand around data-driven marketing. And she was actually a customer twice of sale throughs before joining the company. Previously before that, she worked at Gerson Lehrman Group, where I also worked. She also earlier worked at Savored and theladders.com. She graduated from Duke and she holds an MBA from Tuck at Dartmouth. So she's very smart. Welcome, Cassie. Thanks, Sam, for having me. Excited to be here. I'm excited to have you, especially taking a look at some of the comments and some of the conversation we were having offline. I think it's going to be a great conversation. So First things first, we want to get your, uh, as we call it, your baseball card out of the way, just to frame your experience and perspective for everybody that's listening. So CCO, I don't hear that title a lot. What does it stand for? Sure, absolutely. So it's the chief commercial officer. And I think more often than not, we hear the title chief revenue officer, particularly when it's someone like myself who oversees both sales and the client services component. We had a lot of back and forth internally around whether or not we wanted to use that title. And we went in the direction of chief commercial officer because we thought revenue had a bit more of a sales tone, which we thought could be daunting on the client services side of things, which is how we netted out where we did. Cool. Well, I love it. Congratulations. Thank you. So tell us about sale through. Absolutely. So SailThrough is a marketing software company that is focused on two verticals. We work with media and publishers, as well as retail e-commerce businesses to help them personalize their experiences for their customers. So uh, effectively, what we do is we take a brand like Business Insider, track what their readers are doing across all of the various channels and make it easy for Business Insider to then give personalized recommended content in email on their website and in their mobile app through things like push notification. We've been in the market now for coming up on 10 years, which is kind of wild. I've been at the company for five years. As you mentioned before, Sam, I've known the company for quite a bit longer than that, closer to eight, just because of my exposure on the customer side. But we're headquartered here in New York. Um, We've raised $48 million to date. We have not raised in four years, over four years now, coming up on four and a half. That $48 million came from a host of different investors, RRE led our uh, Series A, Benchmark was behind our B, and then Scale Venture Partners was behind our C round. And today we're between $40 and $50 million ARR, just over 200 employees headquartered in New York. And then we have uh, sort of small supporting offices in London, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and interestingly, Wellington, New Zealand, by way of an acquisition that we made there about two years ago. That is, well, as chief commercial officer, you're obligated to go to Wellington at least three times a year. You know, I I would agree, right? And it's predominantly an engineering office, but my attitude is they need to know what's going on in the front lines of the business. You're a staunch proponent of transparency. So we got to get... Exactly. That's fantastic. So let's just jump into it. So SailThrough hasn't raised money in four and a half years. That's awesome and rare. What's kind of like, what's the operational perspective on the business that's driving that decision or non-decision? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll touch on that in a minute, but I love that you commented that it was awesome because as a leader of the business, this is something I have to coach people around pretty regularly because I think we see in the space, and I know we'll talk more about the market at large, there's a lot of companies raising a lot of money, right? And inevitably, frontline staff, when they see companies taking on massive investments, they'll say, oh, you know, why is that company going and, and raising X amount of money? And we sort of politely remind them that we're on this march to cash flow profitability to be masters of our own destiny and that, you know, venture capital is debt, right? And so this is something uh, we have to remind people of regularly. But the decision for us is we talk about our company goals in three broad buckets and we keep these consistent year over year, even though the numbers change. And I'll, I'll explain how this ties into the, the raise bit in a minute. The first is to grow our business. The second is to be a trusted partner to our clients. And the third is 
to operate predictably and responsibly, right? And in that bucket, we just made a, a very clear decision that we want to be masters of our own destiny, as I said before, and to really get to the point of being a cash flow positive company. We've had this in bumps historically. This year will be the first year you know, fingers crossed, but I think we're in good shape where, you know, we'll be cash flow positive for the entirety of 2018. And this is a decision, you know, we set at the executive level that we're bringing down into the trenches. And that has implications, which we'll talk more about later, uh, for all of the different teams, right? Because this flows into how we collect cash from our customers. Um, it flows into how we think about our professional services team, but it is a very deliberate decision that we've made. The one other bit of color I would add there is, like many startup companies, I think Sail Through went through you know the peaks and valleys where you know you hit a year or two where you struggle. We had a year where we struggled with our growth, and that I think is what ultimately prompted the decision to be laser focused on the profitability metric because we tend to think a lot about the rule of 40. Um, and so for those who aren't familiar about it, we look at the rule of 40 as basically what is your growth rate top line plus sort of your EBITDA or some proxy for it line, right? So this is why companies that are growing at you know 80% year over year could be actually losing at a 40% margin money, right? And still be good because they hit that rule of 40. And so when we had that year or two of slower growth, we said, okay, we need to make sure um, that the slower growth and what we'd like to see is protected by that sort of bottom line piece. And that's just a little bit more historical context on, on what had us thinking about that. And we've just stuck to it over the years from there. As I said, I use that ubiquitous adjective, awesome, but it's because I assumed four and a half years since a raise that you guys are working towards profitability and cash flow yeah. break even. And that's, I like businesses that do that because- Yeah, not many get there. Businesses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about, you know, sort of your origin story. You've been doing startups for a long time. You and I met in my axial days. So that's got to be at least seven, maybe uh, eight yeah. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, tell us how you got into startups and sort of what your journey was. Yeah, absolutely. You said it. I've been in the startup land in New York for 12 years, and it's been pretty fascinating to see the changes here over that time. I started my career in investment banking covering media and tech companies. And I think I mentioned to you, Sam, the hot transactions in 2005 were MySpace, right? Being bought by News Corp. So it's a very different time, but it's exciting to see. But when I worked in banking, I absolutely loved the companies I was covering. I did not love being a banking analyst. And I sort of started building a little bit of a network inside the bank and sort of looking for opportunities in tech outside of it. But the really fascinating thing is that in 2006, there were not a lot of venture-backed startup companies in New York City. And it's somewhat fortuitously that I ended up getting connected uh, with the ladders.com, which is still around today, but a very different business than it was then and met the founders, met the team there. And I always say they took a massive leap of faith on me because I had zero ounces of operating experience, but they were looking for someone who was just sort of a strong business analyst who had the data and quantitative chops. And, and not coincidentally, the founders there were formerly bankers, which probably had a, a lot to do with it. But The Ladders was my first foray uh, into tech. I absolutely loved it. I loved sort of learning about all the different nuances of businesses and how they worked. I was there for a number of years. I stayed there sort of through the, the credit crisis and recession in 08 and then bleeding into 2009. And just quite frankly, I left New York to go back to pursue my MBA full-time in 2009 and was convinced that I was going to have to move to California afterwards. Mm. Um, and I actually spent a reasonable amount of time while pursuing my MBA out in the Valley. Um, I spent the summer in between working for the exec team at AOL on their turnaround strategy, which is interesting and gives me good lens in other places, but was really relieved to see that in the two years that I was up in New Hampshire, the startup scene here had really just exploded, right? And you know, when I left, I think guilt was just getting off the ground. There were a couple of other consumer startups picking up. And so you know, it was a natural choice to come back. I was actually running a business from Dartmouth focused on helping early stage companies with their pitch decks for VCs around how they're telling a story with their data. Um, and I came back to work for one of those that was um, at the time called Village Vines. We rebranded it to Savored, was there for a bit. The company uh, ultimately sold to Groupon. And then, as you mentioned earlier, Sam did something a little bit different at GLG, where it's a kind of not the old company, but older compared to many of the startups in New York to help them sort of bring more of the business online um, and ended up at sale through from there. So I always say it's, you know, really three startups between the ladder, Savored and sale through GLG, kind of maybe a start within a little bit on some of the things that are working there. It's been really fascinating to see. And I think the other interesting dimension for me is 
working at businesses that are marketplace businesses at the ladders and at Savored, but then certainly stuff that's pure play B2C and then at sale through certainly classically B2B SaaS. So definitely have had my uh, fingers in a, a number of different places. But as I said, it's been really fantastic to see just how much the New York tech scene has exploded over the course of that decade plus. So it, it has been amazing. I think there's probably a, quite a few people, or maybe at least one, being me, that's listening and thinking, okay, you were a banker. How did you think about, you know, a lot of people, quote unquote, want to work at startups, but how did you figure out what function within the startup world you thought you could play a role in? And how did you, you know, years later now, you know, you, you would describe yourself as a seasoned sales and marketing executive, but how did you figure out where to go when yeah. you were leaving the banking world and trying to find an entree? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And I think the number one thing for me was finding a role that was quantitatively charged, but not finance, right? So I love our FP&A team. That's not the work that gets me revved up. But what I would say is, I think why I have a great relationship with them, and then we'll talk about where I went specifically, is because I understand all of those concepts and built those models once upon a time, right? So I don't think a lot of people who are traditionally in the type of role that I'm in can lean in with them, right? And talk about sort of, you know, what the cash projections look like, et cetera, which is definitely a leg up. But where I ultimately decided to go, and I tell this story all the time, is when I decided to leave banking, I was 24 years old and so naive that I don't think I understood the difference between marketing and advertising. And I look back on that now and I'm like, how can that be? And what I mean by that is a lot of people said, well, you should go into a marketing role because marketing is very data-driven. And I thought of marketing and I thought they meant an agency, right? And it's not until I started poking around and speaking to people that I realized that when marketing, and particularly at that time, direct response marketing was done well, it was no difference, different, right, than really managing long-term financial analysis. And what I mean by that is, you know, cohort analysis of the customers you acquire. Um, the other example I give people is at the ladders, we spent a lot of money um, on paid search at that time. So we were spending upwards of $9 million a year on paid search. And we called it like our mini hedge fund, right, of keywords, because we would short and long keywords. But anyway, the, the way I got into it was actually just networking and sort of talking to people who I respected in the space who said, you know what, with your analytical skills, you would be really great in marketing. And so um, when I went and spoke with the team at the ladders, it just so happened that that is what they were looking for. And uh, Alex Duzay, who was uh, one of the co-founders and running the marketing function, I think is arguably probably the best marketer I've ever met. And I tell people that I think I really lucked out in terms of I didn't know anything about this company and went to work for Alex and learns so incredibly much. And so from that point forward, I think the ladders gave me a chance to really become a subject matter expert on subscription marketing, consumer marketing, uh, data-driven marketing. But what I also really love about it is Mark Senadella, who was the CEO there at the time and is still the CEO today, I think is one of the most forthright, transparent CEOs I'll ever work for and is a mentor to me personally. So the amount that I just took out of that experience in terms of how you run a business, right? And how you uh, communicate it with the staff was huge. And so for me, that's how I sort of, I made the break from the marketing angle. Um, and then I really just spent the next several years trying to expand that. So when I was working for the president of the consumer division at AOL, um, I spent a lot more time on kind of the macro business. So uh, what were they doing in the turnaround strategy? What did that mean for different parts of the business? What did that mean by way of monetization? So I sort of started inward with marketing and then took roles from that point forward that had adjacencies at other parts of the business that could really help me propel forward. And the big part of that is like, you know, ultimately running a PL, you know, kind of building that experience over time brought me in different places. And sales, to be totally blunt, is directly managing a, a frontline sales team is a newer foray to me. I've been touching that business for years. My team uh, historically ran the install based commercial team, so renewals and upsells. But the reason I'm super excited about it is because I do think, like, particularly in marketing tech where sale through sits, it, there are so many companies and there are many plays that are just kind of commodity plays at this point in the space. And so being able to differentiate on value and knowing the space well is huge. And so the reason I bring that up is because I'm excited to bring to our sales team subject matter expertise around what we're selling and think about how that's a point of differentiation for us um, in the market that is very, very, very congested. Well, I think uh, the sales team knowing what they're selling is that's the holy grail, right? <laughs> that's what we hope for. Yeah. So you said a couple of things just now that I'd love to just drill deeper on. And one of them sure. is uh, the value of transparency. I know when you think about the lessons that you've learned from your time at startups, I know transparency looms large. 
what's your approach to it? How do you think about it? I'm particularly interested as you're doing now, and as I've had some experience doing, when you're running a global office, Mm -hmm. where cultural norms around transparency are different. How do you think about it? Do you say, frankly, fuck it, like we're going to do it the way that I know how to do it. And if there's kind of like people or cultures that are a little bit more secretive or private or just take a different approach to information, I'm just going to trust that whether you're in London or whether you're in New Zealand or whether you're in Chicago, everybody can be the adult and handle the information. How do you think about that? Yep. And you hit the nail on the head. I have totally said, screw the norms and this is the way I'm going to do it. And what I'll tell you, and the reason for that, and then I'll tell you how it's played out is because inevitably you have pockets of different personalities in every one of those offices. So there just simply cannot be incongruent incongruent information or different information passed through because at just over 200 employees, it's a small enough organization that people talk all the time. So there has to be a consistent message, tone, et cetera, that comes through. Otherwise, you know, we know what happens. And what I'll tell you is there's a couple of different, very tactical things I do to promote transparency. And I'll I'll tell you how those have sort of shook out for me. So the first thing is every single Monday night for the last four years, I send this very wordy uh, weekly update from me to all of my teams. And in that update, I give them a couple different things. One is a breakdown of how we're pacing on the quarter, including just updates on key deals we're working and key renewals, just so no one misses a beat on where we're at, if a decision's been delayed, so on and so forth. But then I also just give them a kind of plethora of other sort of comments and updates from across the business, ranging from who's visiting what offices, what are we talking about as an executive team. So coming out of each one of our executive staff meetings every Monday morning, we explicitly call out, is there anything we're not comfortable cascading to the org? Anything other than that, I cascade to the organization proactively, right? And so my team knows they get this kind of lengthy delivery for me when they show up on Tuesday morning, they have something to read. And actually, a few people have asked me to turn that into a podcast. But I told them, you know, I, I did a survey and people said, no, we like to search for those in email. And I said, guys, I'm not doing the email and the podcast. So <laughs> uh, we, stuck, we stuck with the email because it does take a little bit of time. But the reason I share that is because I would say actually a number of people in our London office have said to me, I have never worked in a company this transparent. And I joke with them. I said, it's probably just me, right? I'm an open book and sometimes to a fault, right? Where people will come back and say, well, you said X, Y, or Z, but I think it's really worked really well for us. And I do it in a few other places as well too. I do monthly uh, kind of coffee roulette with different members of the team where I'll get four or five people from ideally different teams uh, within my broader purview to kind of get together and catch up. And then uh, once a month, I do just a very quick 45 minute regional sync with the different offices. So um, I'll do a 45 minute sync with everyone in the London office, 45 minutes with everyone on the West Coast. New Zealand, we treat this a little bit differently uh, one-off since it's predominantly engineering. So I don't you know, do as much on a regular cadence with them. But I find that these avenues for being able not only to share information, but more importantly, to have a two-way conversation about things are absolutely huge. And the same thing has played out for me in terms of you know, in taking over the sales role. I'm obviously presenting in things like company all hands. I think it's been a wake-up call for everyone because I won't just go up there and say, here are the logos we close. I'll actually go a level deeper and say to the team, here's where we're at in pipeline, right? And great, we hit the number this quarter, but I'm worried about next quarter because this is what our coverage ratio looks like, right? So I really try to bring that forward. And that, again, is something that I've just learned from working at past companies where the example I give people always is at the ladders, uh, we had a very detailed all-company meeting every single Monday morning. And it was so detailed that I, as a reminder, it was a subscription business on the uh, consumer side at that time. I genuinely think people in our customer service team could explain the difference between cash and deferred revenue. That's how detailed it was. Right? <laughs> and so I think about that often and I, I don't quite boil the ocean to that extent now, but I, I do think that that opportunity for helping people learn uh, is also a huge part of the transparency play. I use some of the same tactics that you just described. I send my weekly summary email on the weekend normally, and I'm going to yeah. actually do that over after we get off the phone. Yeah. Here. So yeah, one of the other things you talked about uh, or we've talked about is resilience. I, I think your anecdotes there are, are super interesting when it comes to like the lessons that you've learned from your time at startups. How do you approach resilience yeah. and how do you approach, you know, you've mentioned uh, to me offline, like trusting the process, but yeah. explain that in a little bit more detail. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll share with the audience that my team likes to joke that at least every six months, they get the Cassie Young stand on a soapbox and give the resilience talk. You know, I I do take it to heart. And where that comes from is 
anyone who has been a part of a startup knows that it's sort of the classic S curve, right? Where there's crazy growth and then you hit a growing point, a growing pain, and you have to sort it out. And it takes a little bit of time and it's uncomfortable and it's often ugly, but that's what makes you a great leader. And that's what gives you the experience, right? And I'll tell you, we went through a, a challenge at sale through in 2014 where we had to migrate our data center and it, was a shit show and a half, right? Um, particularly for our client services team. And we had many people who sort of just said, that's it. Like I'm leaving in the moment. And I, this is the first time I kind of gave that soapbox talk that now goes out in infamy where, you know, I said to the team, you can leave now, but if you leave now, you don't have the resume experience of how you manage through a problem like this. And every company has those problems at every stage in their growth. And if you're at a company where you don't think that they have those problems, then one, either they're just not being transparent and you don't know about them, or you're so much a cog in the machine that you're just that separated from the problem, right? And so I try to tell people, every time you hit a challenging point, this is something else to add to your personal arsenal around situations that you've led through. And this is what makes great leaders, right? And separates people from who are just there, um, you know, to do it all day from versus whatever else. And, you know, I, I think resilience and transparency play in so much together. And I'll, I'll share this example I, I recently had with our SDR team where, we don't have any open closing roles right now. And the natural path for our SDRs is to go into what we call a sales director role. And it's just, we're not going to have one for several months. And we've had a number of people on the team who've been in the SDR role for 18 to 24 months and they're chomping at the bit and, you know, they feel like they should have that job tomorrow. And so I finally, you know, had this bit the other, the couple weeks ago where I just said to the team, listen, we don't have any of these roles. You have kind of three different options here. One is, if you really don't want to be in your job anymore, we have a host of other roles open across the company. You can look at those. If you want to stay in sales, it's probably not the best move, but you can do that. Number two is, you like being an SDR and you want to wait it out. So you agree to keep being an SDR, but to do well and to be performance managed against you know our numbers and our expectations. Or three is, you find a job somewhere else. And I think I shocked people when I said that, but I'm also a huge believer in exporting talent um, at the right time. And I think this comes back to a little bit of resilience as well too, where you make it through a, a lot of things at a company, but you also have to know sort of when the time is right and when you've gotten the most out of it, if the, the right thing isn't there immediately. And my preference is always for people to find the next best thing at sale through. But if I think they're going to find the next best thing somewhere else, I'm going to be their number one advocate in making that happen because I'm a big believer in having a bunch of happy sale through alums running around the city and not people, you know, who are jaded, right? That they didn't get what they, you know, thought uh, was promised to them. So I no false promises is a big part of that. But you know, the resilience piece, I think I said to you, uh, Sam, around trusting the process is that things don't always go the way you think the first time you have to be willing to wait it out and you have to trust the process because if you have a good leadership team, they are doing what is right for the long-term good of the company. And I think it's very easy for people to get impatient and not want to see that through. And so that's why I said, I'm a huge believer. I tell people all the time, just trust the process. We're looking out for you. We have everyone's best interests in mind, but things take time sometimes. And I think, you know, impatience uh, kills all. Yeah. I've said, I've had a lot of those same conversations and um, I think that can be tough for people to process. The other thing I often say is, you know, if you want more opportunities, the thing that's going to determine opportunities is growth. So as long totally. as you help us grow and yeah. the company growth, there's going to be new AE positions open up. I use that same <laughs> line. I couldn't agree more. I'm like, good news. You can help us to open yeah. a new role, right? Just crush exactly. the pipeline goal. We'll need another person. Yeah, exactly. So give us your take on kind of the market, the startup ecosystem. System. You know, you are a thought leader in the space, at least in New York. You've been around the block enough and you know enough people that I think people come to you and look to you for sort of your point of view on what's going on in the landscape. What's your take on things these days? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mentioned before, the first thing is I'm super excited to see sort of the state of where New York City is at right now, kind of going from small handful of venture back companies to, you know, you're tripping over them in the street these days. But, you know, what I'll tell you is I think what's been alarming to me is exactly how many companies there are now, right? And my follow on to that is I think what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of first time founders who underestimate just how hard it is to build a company, right? And I always say, like, I, I do a lot of work with a lot of, you know, the incubators and accelerators here in New York is, you have to be so passionate about the idea that you have and what you are building. And I do worry 
that we see this trend of like people who want to be a founder or CEO and just force fit a business idea to be a founder, right? That's definitely a little bit concerning to me. And I always give people this personal example of my long-term career path. I would love to be a CEO or a COO. And I tell people, I would love to do that for the right company, right? And so the example I give is, I really respect HR technology. I would never go work for an HR company. It's just not where my personal passion is. My personal passion is in marketing analytics and data, right? And so you have to stay true to that. And I do worry that I see a little bit of people sort of falling off course about that. We've all heard the classic uh, line that, you know, in Silicon Valley, the tech is tech, right? But in New York, uh, the tech is industry. And I do think that's very true. And it keeps things very interesting. I also think the startup costs for business with the, you know, the advent of S3, et cetera, make it very easy to get things off the ground, but that businesses need to have a road to build a business and not just a feature, right? And I see this a lot in software where I meet, you know, software founders and I say, is this really a robust business and what's the plan to get there? Or is this really like what I would call a point solution for something that maybe could be a nice tuck-in for somewhere, somewhere along the line, but I don't get excited about businesses that are, you know, born and grown to be, you know, a tuck-in acquisition. It's, you know, how can you build something that is, is really, really exciting. So I guess in summary, I love seeing all the momentum. I think it is going to be, there's so many companies out there that it's going to be interesting to see sort of who's emerged. And I love some of the fantastic exits that have happened for some of the New York companies um, in recent months. And I'm eager to see more of that. But I also think that there's going to have to be a little bit of a shakeout just given the vast volume of, uh, of companies we see on this sort of have taken VC money map in the last five years. I completely agree. And I think what you said is really interesting. So many people that they want to be founders. I had a conversation recently with an aspiring founder and we started talking about their customers. And I said, well, what? tell me about your customer's day. Tell me about he or she, what problem are they trying to solve and how are you helping them solve that problem? And I got a quizzical look on the face. And the point I was trying to make is you're an evangelist on behalf of your customers. That's what the business does. And it's not just a vehicle for you to sort of like self-actualize. Right. You know, like the, the thing has to exist on behalf of somebody else whose problem you're trying to solve, which I think was a, a strange concept for the person I was speaking with. I totally agree with that. And it's funny, like people always say to me, oh, are you going to go start your own thing? And I'm like, no, because I don't have an idea that I'm passionate about, right? Like, sure, I could probably go start a business, but it wouldn't end well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I'd love to talk a little bit about, because you at Sale Through, mm-hmm. you've been running the customer success team for a long time. Yeah. Tell us about the transition to running the sales team and what you think are kind of like the, the pluses and the minuses, the benefits and disadvantages. Part of that probably being how you can align the customer journey more effectively. Yeah, absolutely. So certainly the kind of notion of, uh, I'll put it positively, like one uh, touch point for the entire customer life cycle, right, is great. But um, the reason I say, uh, put it diplomatically the first time is I joke with prospective clients now that you have one throat to choke, right? So I'm not going to sell you something that my same team can't service. Um, so it's great to see it play it out from that end. But kidding aside, I think what's been really interesting is what you learn above all else on the client services side is what your best customer looks like, right? And that can be in terms of the industries that they're in. So I mentioned before, like we're really hunkered down in two spots, um, that media and commerce, because we think we have plenty of room to grow in those markets without attacking adjacencies. But beyond that, just the industry bit, deal size, right? Uh, Complexity. So what I mean by that is, you know, we've learned a lot from customers who work with third-party development teams. Like they tend to not really do well with sale through, right? And we need to better account for that um, in the sales process. So kind of taking all of those learnings and sort of putting it into action in terms of making sure that we shut things down early um, has been huge. And a, a tactical example of that has been, you know, we, um, our minimum deal size right now on paper, right, is $75,000 a year. Now, inevitably, what happens is people are working smaller deals. It's the end of the quarter, right? And and boom, somehow an exception is made. My commitment now is I know that those customers, it's not that we don't like those businesses and we don't think that they're interesting. I know that the customers that are smaller than that consume an insane amount of time from our CSM. So we actually have our CSMs time track and the band of clients that's under 100K ACV, let's say that it's just south of 15% of sale total revenue and aggregate. 
they take more than 30% of our CSM's time, which is insane to me, right? The imbalance. And then we also know that those customers, you know, tend to have higher churn and contraction rates. So I don't want to be selling to them. And again, it's, I want to sell to them when they get a little bit bigger, but now is at the right time. And so, you know, much to the chagrin of the sales team, I now have an alert coming from Salesforce. If anyone tries to move a deal into pipe, right? That's below that size so that we can address it head on versus kind of getting in this, you know, tough end of quarter discussion. But I think the bigger thing for me has been like, not just doing that for the sake of doing it, but educating the sales team on why we do that. So actually one of the first things I did in the new role was take our sales team through the business rationale for why we're moving up market. And that included taking them through the time tracking data. And the thing I explained to them was, you know, every deal that you close that's of this smaller variety is one more account that this CSM over here has to service that takes away from the time they are spending with the likes of Hearst. And don't you want as the salesperson Hearst to be driving additional business, to be referring us into other places. We need to make sure that we're focused on the customers that are really going to be the biggest propeller of the business forward. So that I think has been the most interesting bit. But at the same time, like the conflicting piece has been, yeah, I also want to make sure we get deals over the line. Are you willing to putting, you know, sort of like applying grass tax yeah. the last week of the quarter, just like it just was, yeah. you've got, a, you've got a, you know, a sales director and AE come to you and say, Cassie, I can close this deal. But uh, it's going to be for sixty thousand. But this is going to be the deal, or this the set of two deals is going to be the two deals that get us to the number that you told yeah. us you wanted. Yeah. Us. Would you turn that deal down? So I'm going to answer that in a second. I'm first going to give a quick caveat, which is I think we're trying to solve for is we have a slightly longer sales cycle. I don't want to ever get to the point where that's a conversation the last week of the quarter, right? We shouldn't, like it shouldn't be that late stage that we're discussing a deal of that size, right? And so my thing to the team is I'm always happy to look at a one-off business, right? Like we started working with Jet before they launched. That was a great business move, right? So you look at, you know, who's back the company? What does the growth plan look like? But I want to look at that early. And if I didn't know a ton about that deal, I wouldn't endorse it at the end of the quarter because that's something where like myself and our CFO have to give the green light in advance that we're okay going after a customer of that size. And we actually did have our first scenario in Q1 where there was kind of an interesting company who came back and said, you know, you guys are too expensive. This is what we need the price to be. And it was no less complex than anything else. And we walked from the deal. And I think that's the first time we've ever done that. But I do believe, and I was going to hit on this point in a minute, the one nice thing for me in running both sales and CS is that I talked about like our company framework of goals before. My number for growing our business is an exit ARR number, no matter how we get there. Right now, we of course have to bring ample new logo business in. But the reason I mention that is because for me, it's how do we grow new logos? But two, how do we mitigate churn, right? And ensure um, strong growth from the install base and strong net dollar retention rate. And so my argument in that type of scenario would be, great, I could book this deal today to guarantee 50 grand in gross churn next year, right? Yeah. Um, or in two years. And this is, I think, and I think, you know, Sam, you and I talked about this at some point. What I think I bring a lot to the table on is balancing short-term versus long-term, right? And it's really funny for me because we tell our clients that sail through all the time, you know, you guys, and these are all just consumer marketers, right? You're so focused on driving sales and revenue today that you don't care about the long-term impact on your customers and you erode lifetime value, et cetera, et cetera. And I tell our team, I'm like, guys, we need to eat our own dog food on that concept. It can't just be, oh, it's end of quarter and we really need this 50 grand. So even though it's not a great customer, we're going to bring them in because that's 50 grand we're going to have to work to win back. You know what I mean? When it doesn't play out. And again, there's always exceptions to the rule. And with the right com like compelling business case, we'll sell smaller deals, but it has to be an executive bought in decision um, to do that. Not something that's made in the 23rd hour, uh, you know, on the 30th of the month. Yeah, no, that's true. The point that you're bringing up though is so it's so important. This is what the word for me, alignment means. Yes. Because your capital strategy, your cash flow strategy, your sales strategy, your CS strategy, and your market size and your deal size, like everything has to be aligned because yes. if you're making those decisions in isolation, but you have an unrealistic target, then the business is out of alignment. If, you know, so like as long as your growth expectations are in line with both the reality, the market size, you know, and you're on the same page as your CFO, then I think that that's the best place to be, obviously. 
Yes, absolutely. And I, you know, I alluded to this before. I'm fortunate that I have a great relationship with our CFO. I think coming from a financial background, I understand what the levers are for growth and for businesses and how we're going to be assessed by our own investors and then, you know, other investors down the line. Um, so that's huge. But I think, Sam, one other thing I mentioned to you that we've done to really drive alignment is we actually have sales ops sitting in FPNA right now. And the reason for that was, you know, historically, if I rewind two years ago, we had this challenge where sales would have a plan. If we missed the plan, we had to go back. We had to reforecast before every board meeting, right? And there was just one missing step between those teams. Whereas now that's a joint effort on figuring out exactly what the plan needs to look like. How do we derive the comp plans? It's just very thoughtful. The one challenge that I would tell people about is inevitably, and we love our FP&A and uh, sales ops folks, the messaging can be very different coming from them to a team in terms of goal setting than coming from you know, someone like you or me, right? Um, and so for me, a big part of it is how do I work really closely with that team where our SDRs, for instance, don't feel like it's finance telling them they have to go have this many activities per week, right? It's, this is how we work through it. And I, I'm a huge believer in, I joke with people, I'm like, I, I take my team back to eighth grade science on a regular day and talk about the scientific method, right? And I tell them like, any number I give you is a hypothesis for right now, and I'm willing to be disproven. Um, and how do we manage through that? But they need to hear that from leadership in sales and not from finance. So while there's very close coordination, I do think that's just one kind of nuance that it you know is can potentially be a, a challenging point and people need to think about it. So you are just a customer of sales ops, but sales ops actually formally reports up through the CFO. Is that right? That's correct. That is it's a funny, that, approach. It, it is. And uh, I sit, though, directly next to our main sales ops guy, <laughs> <laughs> very so, deliberately. It's like a moral authority. Every day. I'm like, Ryan, do we have a report for this? So he's, <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, we got a few more questions. And then I'd love, I think sure. I'd love to end with some of your, you know, your role models, mentees and yeah. influences, because those are always amazing. But you've been doing this a lot. You've been doing it in marketing and sales. We always ask this question just because it's the sales audience. But do you think sales? SDRs, should they report to marketing or sales? Um, I think they should report to sales. And I think what I mentioned to you is we have tried both. The reason I like them reporting to sales, and I think there's merits of both, don't get me wrong, we've seen pros and cons of both sides, is the alignment to the sales directors and to the RVPs. The reason I say this is because I see a lot of problems when teams start thinking about well, pipeline from marketing, pipeline from sales. Like at Sale Through, the biggest lesson we've learned is there is one pipeline number owned by the commercial team. Yes, our head of marketing and I have a lens into what should be coming from where that we talk about with our executive team. But to everyone else, there's one pipeline number. And I think it just makes it cleaner you know, for that. And I also do think um, when we made the change back from SDRs going from marketing to sales, we just saw much, much, much better alignment between the SDs and the SCRs in terms of um, how they ultimately work together. That's interesting. Well, that is an off debate. When you think about what percentage marketing should contribute to an enterprise sales pipeline, how do you think about pipeline composition? Do you think that the reps should be prospecting 20% of their own deals, 40% of their own deals, none of their own deals? When you think about the composition of the right pipeline, what are your ingredients? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll actually tell you specifically how we think about it. So in general, we expect marketing uh, to drive about 40% of our pipeline. That could be through events, it could be through content, it could be through anything that we're ultimately doing there. We then expect, what I'll, the caveat I'll put on that is some of that may be work through the SDRs ultimately, right? Because you have like a asset download, right? That ultimately the SDR picks up, but something that ties back to marketing in some way um, that could be influenced by the SDR. We have the SDR, we assume that they're outbound prospecting and that could be you know, their emails, going to meetups, whatever it might be, generates another 25% for us. So again, in total, it's probably more than 25% when you look at the inbounds they're picking up off of uh, marketing. Like in total, I would actually say that's probably 65% if you think about it, because anything that marketing influences is ultimately going to get picked up by an SDR. The remainder of things for us, so, you know, another 15%, call it, we expect it comes from referrals. Uh, that, you know, is either through other customers, through employees, whatever it might be, but that's, you know, loosely how we think about our breakdown. So, again, marketing, I would say it's really 65% SDR, but 40 of the 65 is marketing driven, if that makes sense. Right. And, but the interesting thing you just said, or not that it wasn't all interesting, 15% coming from referrals, which is almost a way of saying 15% coming from customer success. Yes. Exactly. In a way. It's, it's exactly saying that. And it's funny, our two largest transactions of Q1 
what did they both have in common? They were both actually former customers took new roles at new companies and brought us in. And that's been a huge source of success for us, which again, is like, we want the sales team to understand this when we are picky about what deals we sell because we say, hey, we want really happy customers because they then yield more happy customers. Yeah, absolutely. Your stack. So you've got a marketing stack and a sales stack. Let's name some names so that if folks listening want to go out and get the right vendor or use the right technology, they can. So tell us about your, your sales and marketing stack. Yeah, sure. So we use Salesforce as our CRM. My funny joke there is, incidentally, Salesforce now also owns one of our largest competitors. So we'll see how that plays out. We use um, Marketo for a lot of our uh, lead gen and kind of landing page stuff. Salesloft um, is what our SDR team is using. We are a huge fan of Salesloft. So I'll give them a big plug here. Um, We use FunnelWise for a lot of just sort of our top of funnel conversion data. I know that our marketing ops team thinks really highly of FunnelWise in terms of their thought leadership piece and going to them with questions and having them pull data for us. And I, we find them very helpful. And then we use lean data for a lot of just sort of our contact management, et cetera. I would say a lot of those are just tools that we need, but I you know, kind of laid mention to this when we talked about it. The team loves working with Salesloft, not only just because of the functionality of the tool and how it allows us to scale, but also I think, again, to the thought leadership front, they've been really helpful in just providing us insight when we have questions on what's working there. The one thing I did want to mention is the you asked me, Sam, about like, do we have a killer app? Well, one thing that's kind of unique to the sales through business model, and I suspect there's other kind of corollaries for other industries, is we sell licenses based on the channels that you use. So if you buy email, on-site, or mobile from us, email is the lion's share of our business. It's about 80% of our total business, which means we need to have a sense for how big someone is as an email sender. And there's actually a tool for us, it's called eData Source, that lets us see how much email a brand is sending, like a ballpark estimate, and who the incumbent is, right? And that is massively helpful data for our SDRs, right? In terms of knowing who they're on and how do we kind of use FUD based on that particular incumbent. But it's also really helpful for us in terms of equity assignments of our territories, right? So if we know loosely how much email someone's sending, we directionally know the size of the deal. And that just helps us for how we carve up territories, you know, in terms of, you know, who gets what. Yeah. I didn't ask you this. Do you have a field sales team? Like what's the composition of field sales versus inside sales? So the composition of the team right now is we work one SDR to two SDs. We have right now the SDR team is about seven, so you've about uh, you know fourteen who are out in the field. And some mm-hmm. it's a you know ballpark because in some places we'll double up like when we're trying to get off the ground. So London they have slightly better coverage. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. When you think about role models, people that have influenced you over the course of your career, and we want to make sure that they get a shout out. Any great VPs of sales, CMOs, yeah. founders that have played a role? In your yeah, life? absolutely. So the first time I worked really closely with a head of sales was when I was at Savored. And that was with Mike DeLuca, who ran uh, sales at Yodel for a number of years and now is over at Hearst leading a big part of their business. But I met... And the reason I share this answer is I met Mike through a very good personal friend of mine, actually referred him to the job at, at, at uh, Savored, Joel Laffer, who ran the marketing function at Yodel. And I think the pair of those two, I respect them a lot. I always learn a ton. I talk to them. But what I learned the most from Mike is how rah-rah you have to be. That sounds like such a silly answer, but I am a programmed introvert, right? And I always say like, I can put on my e-face when I need to, right? To be the extrovert. <laughs> but he really taught me that, right? And, and he, the example I always give people is he told the team if they hit their number, he could, they could shave whatever they wanted into his head. You know what I mean? Like, that's like the silly lessons that like stick with you in terms of like, he really can pump up a crowd. And so that was really huge for me on that end. I think more broadly on mentorship, and I mentioned this before, Mark Sanadella at The Ladders has been my number one mentor over the years. And what I really like about his style is sometimes when I talk to Mark, I'm, I'm not sure whether to be happy or to cry, right? At like how pointed he is with feedback. <laughs> but it's like the best kind of mentor, right? Because it's, he's always right. And I've gone to him at a, a couple of really important inflection points in my career where to be totally honest, like for this audience, I never would have thought about you know pursuing the sales path. And the first time that idea ever even crossed my mind was sitting at breakfast with Mark seven months ago. He's been fantastic for that. That's amazing. And then you've got some experience with the folks at Primary. So for those that don't know Brad and Ben, tell us your experience with them. Love Brad and Ben. So Brad uh, was one of my board members at Savored. He and I have remained close friends over the years and I've gotten to know uh, Ben with him as well. So for those who aren't familiar with Primary, they're a seed state fund here in New York focused on SaaS and consumer. So two of my favorite places. But what I love about the approach that they're taking is they are taking a very hands-on 
role in helping their portfolio companies grow to the next level. So their hit rate of seed uh, stage companies that actually go on to raise an A round and beyond is off the charts as a result. So they help them with market development, hiring. It's really absolutely fantastic. So I have a ton of respect for what they're doing in terms of, you know, who do I think are interesting investors in New York right now? That's fantastic. All right. Uh, we're almost to the end. What's a great book you've read recently or something that's been really influential so we can um, get to know you a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned how I make our team think about scientific method all the time. Favorite book that I make all of my directs read at some point is Other Side of Innovation, which is basically, it was written by a professor of mine from business school. And it's a series of vignettes about companies trying to innovate, some big, some smaller, and the importance of running measurable experiments to drive success when you're trying to innovate. I highly recommend it. It's a easy read on the subway, but just always gives you a different lens for thought. That's awesome. Well, I guess that I have two last questions. The yeah. first is any motto or guiding principles? What's Is there any sort of uh, broader philosophy that's governing your career as you pursue it? Over yeah, absolutely. So my big thing, and this is a personal one for me, my dad was a very successful executive and became you know terminally ill later in his career and had to dial back his hours. And it was a very tough thing for him. And I always remember my mom telling me the story of when he told his CEO this, the CEO said, 50% of Bill Young is better than 100% of anyone else. So that's fine by me. And I live by that motto every single day of how do I just be indispensable to the point where someone could say the same thing about me. So that is huge. And that's definitely my governing motto. Um, the other thing that I think about every day is you are only as strong as the team that supports you. And I tell myself that and I tell frontline managers that all the time, like it's great and we love people as people, but um, sometimes it's not the right fit. And you have to remember as a manager that that reflects on you. And so that's just kind of the other thing that I tend to be heard over saying a lot between that and then the team likes the joke. I always say, let the numbers speak, right? So <laughs> that would be my more uh, <laughs> lighthearted one. Fair enough. All right. Finally, if people wanted to get in touch with you, yes. either to apply for a job at sale through or yep. to just get your advice on something, what's your preferred communication channel? They reach out to you. Yeah, absolutely. Email is my preferred communication channel. So my email is just C young, Y O U N G at sale through.com. I just tell people I am on the road a lot with customers and prospects. I always clear out my inbox at the end of the week, but it may just take me a couple of days to get back. And to your point, Sam, we'd love to hear from great people. So we're always hiring. And in particular, we're always looking for great FCRs. And we may actually be looking for um, someone to another person to help lead that team later this year. So um, we'd, lo we'd love to hear from folks. Awesome. Well, Kathy, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks again uh, for having me, Sam. Some incredible insights. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Sounds great. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Sam's Corner. Another amazing interview. They're all amazing, aren't they? But I think Cassie Young really was incredibly insightful, incisive. And her experience in the startup ecosystem here in New York is second to none. One of the things that Cassie was talking about was her emphasis on transparency. She walked through a series, essentially a cadence and a series of um, communication platforms that she uses to enforce and reinforce transparency. And one of those things is a weekly email, which I'll send it today, which is a Sunday. She sends it Monday night. Jesse Hertzberg from Livestream used to send his on, on Monday afternoon. But I would really encourage everybody to think about that some method of communicating to the entire organization and then putting as much information in there as you can on a weekly basis. I think you got to make it a mixture of numbers and stories so that obviously the numbers do tell a story. But it's important that the company knows, the engineers know, not just the sales team, but everybody in the company understands where is the business, how is it tracking towards its goals, and then what's some narrative, what's some context on top of those numbers that help us contextualize it. The other thing that I tend to do is I tend to say, here's some highlights, here's some big wins, here's some of the people that contributed to those wins, and then here's some areas for improvement. I don't really call them losses, but I say these are the things we're continuing to work on. These are the big factors that are going to be driving and determining success over uh, the next couple of uh, months and quarters. Besides just providing information, the other thing that it teaches people to do, particularly junior people, is it teaches them how to think about business and how to frame value creation, which again, to the point of Cassie and I's conversation, if you talk to a lot of people, a lot of salespeople, a lot of, a lot of junior people in their careers, that's something that you have to develop. You have to develop a point of view on business. You have to have a point of view on how is value created. And I think a really good weekly summary email, either from the head of revenue, but often from the CEO as well, 
can help frame the way that people should think about value creation within the context of their business. So this has been Sam's Corner. Thanks so much for listening. To check out the show notes, see upcoming guests, and play more episodes from our incredible lineup of sales leaders, visit saleshacker.com slash podcast. You can also find the Sales Hacking Podcast on iTunes or Google Play or anywhere that you consume your podcasts. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with your peers on LinkedIn, Twitter, or elsewhere. Special thanks again to this month's sponsors at Gong. See more at gong.io forward slash sales hacker. And finally, if you want to get in touch with me, you can find me on Twitter at Sam F. Jacobs or on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash and slash Sam F. Jacobs. See you next time. 